Our scripture text this morning is found in Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who is to be born king of the Jews? For we observed his star and its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they heard that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. It has been said that too many Christians worship their work, work hard at their play, and play at their worship. To the extent that this statement is true, it is tragic. It represents an inversion of values, eternal values, that can ultimately lead only to impoverished souls. In the Christmas season just concluded, the statement takes a particular twist, equally unfortunate. For many, the season becomes so full of parties, shopping, and a host of other activities that the birth of Christ is reduced to an excuse rather than the reason for the season. So this is a good time to take a new look at an old lesson, one modeled by an unlikely cast of characters. Today we'll talk about a lesson in worship, a lesson sponsored by the Magi, the three kings or wise men from the East. But first, I'd like to tell you a story that was in one of my Christmas cards. It's the story of the fire worshipers. It seems that while they were traveling, Marcos, and I'm assuming it's Marco Polo's, even though it doesn't say, so that you get a time frame, Marcos caravan came to a town called the Town of the Fire Worshippers because the men of the town worshiped fire. The inhabitants declared that in days gone by, three kings of their country went to worship a newborn prophet and took with them three offerings, gold, frankincense, and myrrh so that they could discover whether the prophet was a god, an earthly king, or a healer. For they said, if he takes gold, he is an earthly king. If he takes the frankincense, he is a god. And if he takes the myrrh, he is a healer. When they came to the place where the prophet was born, they worshipped him, and they offered him the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. The child took all three offerings and then gave them a closed treasure chest. And the three kings set out to return to their own country. 
After they had ridden for some days, they resolved to see what the child had given them. They opened the treasure chest and found inside it a stone. They wondered what could this stand for? The child had given it to them to signify that they should be firm as stone in the faith that they had adopted. But when the three kings saw the child had taken all three offerings, they concluded that he was at once God, king, and healer. And since the child knew that the three kings believed this, he gave them the stone to signify that they should be firm and constant in their belief. But our knowing that, the three kings still have not discovered that. And not knowing why the stone had been given to them, they took it and threw it into a deep well. No sooner had it fallen in the well than there descended from heaven a burning fire, which came straight to the well into which the stone had been thrown. When the three kings saw this miracle, they were taken back and repented of their throwing away the stone, for they saw clearly that its significance was good as well as great. And they immediately took some of the fire and carried it to their country and put it in one of their churches, a very fine and splendid building. They keep it perpetually burning and worship this fire as a god. Even though the descendants of the three kings ended up worshiping the fire instead of the fire giver, it tells us something wonderful about our Lord Jesus and that history, even those who are not Christians, carry references. So now we want to go back to these magi, the three who actually traveled to visit Jesus in Jerusalem. What can we learn from them today? First, worship may arise from persons unlikely to offer it. Now, it would have been no surprise for Jewish people grounded in the traditions of their faith and anticipating the coming of their Messiah to have worshiped Jesus at their coming. But the wise men from the East were outsiders to that tradition. Most probably they were pagan astrologers, priests of a naturalistic religion of the 7th century BC, Median origin. The Old Testament book of David describes practitioners of their order as operating in Babylon in the 6th century BC. These people were also Gentiles. That means anybody who was not a Jew. Under the Old Testament law and in the Jewish social and religious order, they would have been held in very low esteem. They were outside of the covenant and denied the privileged favor of God that the Jews experienced. Their practices of astrology were forbidden to the Jews and that was actually mocked in the Old Testament, further accentuating their alienation from the things of our God. But the Magi surprise us, for Matthew features their eagerness to worship Jesus, the King of the Jews, whose star they had followed all the way to Jerusalem. The surprise is lessened when we realize that their coming attests to the marvelous grace of God. God prompted them to follow the star and led them, who were outside of the Jewish faith, to come and find Jesus. Unlikely worshipers do not arise of their own accord. They do respond to the grace of God freely granted them, whether they are within the tradition 
or outside. Secondly, worship entails resolute purpose. The worship of the Magi was sincere. The text clearly states that the purpose for which they had resolutely traveled so long and far was to offer untainted worship. The term used to describe their intent, the word most frequently used for worship in the New Testament, always presupposes the divinity of the object. How much theology they understood, we don't know. But this much is clear. They knew that they sought the king worthy of worship. When finally they arrived at the end of their journey, they celebrated with great joy. There is a saying that is popular in the Pacific Northwest. When Boeing sneezes, Seattle catches a cold. The obvious point of the saying is that Boeing is such a force in the economy in the Seattle area that the impact of its fortunes touches the entire city. This kind of situation existed in Jerusalem during the reign of Herod. He was such a force, even though he was a capricious force, that when he acted, the whole city braced itself. And so when Herod was troubled by the announcement of the Magi, the city was troubled as well because they did not know how he would react. Herod professed a desire to worship, but his motives behind saying those words was malicious. He was troubled by the announcement of the Magi, fearing the birth of a usurper to his throne. And because he was troubled, so was the whole city, for he was a volatile and emotionally unstable man. I sort of compare him with Saddam Hussein, some of their actions, killing family members, etc., have been the same. He called for the experts to ask where the Christ was to be born. The experts, citing Micah 5.2, combined with 2 Samuel 5.2, and First Chronicles 11.2 informed the king that Christ was to be born in Bethlehem. Treacherously, Herod inquired of the wise men exactly when the star appeared. Later, he would use that information to initiate the slaughter of the innocents, which was babies two to five years old, and that was because of the travel time that the Magi had had. He then sent them to Bethlehem, instructing them to return to him with word so that he could come and worship. His interest and investigation in the matter were solely so that he could pursue his perverse purposes, a pretense of worship to mask his evil heart. Worship does find tangible expression in verses 11 and 12. When the Magi arrived at the house where Jesus was, they fell prostrate in reverence to him. Their posture was a visible outward expression of the submission of their hearts before their king. In addition, they presented their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, expensive tokens of their esteem. Their gifts indicated the disposition of their hearts, for in their way of life bringing gifts was particularly important when one approached a superior. Their gifts also foreshadowed realities concerning Jesus' rule as king his worthiness to be worshipped as a son of God, and his death on the cross to heal all people. The worship of the Magi, an unlikely cast of characters, is instructive for us as well. Our worship, like theirs, is only enabled by divine grace. It is to be offered in sincerity of heart rather than in ostentatiousness or deceit. 
is expressed in humble and sacrificial giving to our matchless Lord. This is the worship that is appropriate for Christmas and throughout the whole year. 